flourishing life, I think, is living a life that follows God's will, but in a way that um, is willing and is content with the direction you put in. Flourishing is where you're going strong or making a difference in the place in which you're planted. When we're growing in Jesus, and also growing in our relationships with other people. Being content and secure in who you are. Uh, in other words, not needing to spend your whole life searching for your life's purpose. When am I flourishing? When I'm serving. I get enormous satisfaction out of helping people, doing things for them, using the gift that God has given me. Flourishing is where you continue to grow no matter what's happening in your life. As you get older, you're either shrinking or you're growing. Being the best that we can, even though we're not perfect. Having happy and fulfilling relationships. To me, living a flourishing life means that I'm living a life um, where I invest my heart and soul and time into things that I will look back on and be happy that I did and not regret. When we're living the way God intended us to live. G'day everybody, my name is Nathan Sandon. I'm the Senior Minister of Oste Thrill Anglican Church. And I'm just really excited to be able to invite you to join with us as we explore this topic of human flourishing over the next coming weeks and months. How would you answer this question of what does it mean to flourish? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you are a good God, that you uh, provide, and Lord, we just thank you for this provision that you brought John and Jenny Reed into our lives and into, into our church family here, but we do pray for them as they begin their time with us, that it would, a ministry here would be a joy to them as they point us and direct us uh, to the person of Jesus and just his death and resurrection, and the way in which it points us to you, God the Father, and so Lord, we just... Thank you, and Lord, we also thank you that in your goodness, you're a God who reveals yourself to us by your word, that you speak, and you speak so clearly to us in your Bible. And so, Lord, we pray as we turn our attention to your word today, Lord, we pray and ask for the work of your spirit to be at work in us, that it would be softening our hearts, that we'd be open to hear your word, and that by your spirit, it would be transforming us, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first reading is Psalm 130, which is a song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than the watchmen wait for the morning. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. The second reading today is from Romans chapter 5. So I invite you to... Open your Bibles to Romans chapter 5, starting at verse 1. The title is Peace and Hope. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that sufferings produce perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. This is the word of the Lord. Our Father God, we thank you that you give us such a glorious hope in your Son, Jesus Christ. We do not yet see who we shall become, but we know in the Lord Jesus Christ, you pour all good things into our lives. Amen. 
I have a copy of the uh, reading here, just in case you're wondering where my Bible is, but because of my eyesight, 65, it gets a little bit... Um, so this is a large print, see? A large print with my scribblings on it. Um, <clears throat> it is just it's such a joy to be here. I, I, I don't think anybody can imagine how, how really joyful uh, my wife and I are feeling at joining you at Ostermere and Thoreau. Um To be part of God's family here, the welcome has just been overwhelming, so thank you very much. That has just been superb. Um, and I am looking forward to getting to know you. I'm a people person. If you give me some administration, I think I'll wilt and die. So um, I love people. That's, that's me. And the, the subject of flourishing, which uh, both uh, Paul and Nathan, I, I've heard Paul two weeks ago and Nathan last week, uh, thinking about what does it mean to flourish as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that, to, that excites me. Uh, because during COVID, I think many of us have struggled with what does it mean to, to flourish. In fact, the word flourish may be the very furthest thing from our mind, uh, how, do we, how we flourish. It's just how do we cope e each and every day. Uh, Paul used that word grit uh, or resilience. And, and then Nathan last week talked about contentment. Contentment. Are we, are we content? Are we content with what God gives, gives us? And this week, I want to consider hope. Hope. Hope that enables us to flourish as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I've certainly been observing people over the last two years, particularly during COVID, and watching how they cope. And, and many, many have not coped. And we know, and you might have heard about um, many of the, much of the mental anguish that people have been undergoing and the, the relational... Uh, and one of the issues that I found in, in my ministry was that older people have been so isolated. Um, and so one of the things that we instituted in the church I came from was that we would phone people up once a week. And so we had everybody in the whole church covered by, by people phoning them and praying with them uh, once a week. But I, I, I was also observing those who are not Christian, and particularly two of my non-believing friends. Uh, uh, that they, they are, that one, one's an executive, a retired executive in a uh, oil company, and the, and the other one has a PhD in ag science. And I thought I'd ask them some questions. And I wanted to ask them, strangely enough, about hope. And I said, what do you hope in? And both of them are articulate gentlemen uh, who are quite relational. They've got their own families. And this was their answer. There is nothing to hope for. They just had nothing to hope for. And I said, surely there must be something and they said, no, we'll just return to dust when we die, and that's our life over. But what about love? Oh, yes, it's a convenience for a while. I, I was rocked to the core as I talked to these two articulate, both intelligent gentlemen about hope. But they had none. And, and you could see it in their lives. There was no hope. There was no joy. They were dust, and they would return to dust. So, brothers and sisters, I long that you will know the power of the hope that Jesus Christ offers us even more this day, that you will carry that hope with you as we, we flourish as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ because our lives are meaningful in God's sight. Everything we do, all that we are, is meaningful, is purposeful in the sight of God. So I want to reflect a bit on Psalm 130 and then a couple of reflections at the end on Romans 5. I don't, go, I don't preach for longer than an hour, so you'll be very happy about that. <clears throat> right. So the biblical concept of hope, it's not the kind of like the way we, we, we use it in, a, in general terms. Like, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow, and I'm sure all of us are hoping that. We've had enough of rain for a while. Anyway, um, I hope my trousers stay up, because I've lost 10 kilograms in the last few months, and uh, yeah, I'm very excited about that, so is my wife, but the problem is I haven't tightened my belt. Anyway, that's a kind of, that's a wishy-washy, and I bet you're hoping my trousers stay up too. Um, that is a kind of a finger-crossing, wishy-washy sort of hope, so if I keep fiddling with them, please excuse me. Now, but I, I want this, this quote from a guy called John Piper, who I like very much. I press the button. Oh, look at that. Ellie, you're wonderful. Uh, John Piper says this, hope is confident expectation of good things to come. Full assurance of what is to come. So no wonder the Apostle Paul can say, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. 
I'm going to have fun with this, Elliot. Do I, which button do I press? The right one? That one? That's the question I want to ask, but this is the uh, comment that from the Apostle Paul. Oh, there you go. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. That's what he says. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. So Psalm 130 then. We can have confidence that God hears us. We, we, we can be confident that God hears us. Uh, the psalmist says this. There you go. Oops, I've gone too far. I'm too excited here. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let, my, let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. Now, I don't know about you. You might think, oh, my prayers are never heard. I pray and I pray and God doesn't answer that there's a kind of a glass ceiling above us and our prayers kind of hit that ceiling and, and rebound and our requests don't get through. But please hear, hear this, this reflection, this, this comment, this, this plea. It's a desperate plea by the psalmist. Out of the depths, I cried to you. We often think, you know, if we're in a bad situation, oh, well, God won't hear me because maybe I've even been responsible, partly responsible for the situation I, I've got in. So we don't pray. When we, we feel miserable, we feel lousy, we feel we've let God down, we may have let other people down. But here he says, look, look at these words here, out of the depths. He's in the pit and he knows the only one who can answer him, the only one who can help, the only hope is God. Even in the depths, even in the pit, he cries out to God. Now, please don't let me, don't be, let me be heard saying the prayer is like a magic wand. Uh, God is not Harry Potter or Professor Dumbledore. Um, you know, you need to ask your kids about those references. If you, if you don't we don't wave a magic wand. But Jesus himself does give us this assurance. You may ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. It's not carte blanche. But God says through Jesus Christ, bring everything to me. Nothing is, is out of bounds. Nothing that I don't want to hear. He who loves us wants the best for us. Are you absolutely convinced by that? That he wants the very best for us. And even when we do go through the worst possible times in life, God is not absent right there he wants to be with you he gives us real hope whatever you're going through whether it's to do with COVID to do with relationships our gracious God holds out hope in the midst of my pain your pain our anguish and invites us to lay our burdens on him but I guess even better the second uh, reflection of the psalm is um, we can have confidence that God forgives. In verses 3 and 4, If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. I chatted with a lady a number of years ago. I went to see her. Um, she was a member of the church I was attending at the time. And uh, in our conversation, she said she had not spoken to her daughter for 30 years. 30 years. I, I find this in, in conversations with people, the most amazing things happen. And, and she laid her pain before me. And obviously, um, I prayed with her. But I suggested, I was a bit brave. I suggested, maybe you'd like to ring her. You should have seen her face. No way, she said, fat chance. I'll never speak to her again. I don't know whether you can imagine my joy when she told me that she'd called her daughter and that they had met for the first time in 30 years and it went well. Forgiveness. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, th this is the truth that you and I have rebelled against God, that we stand as men and women in need of God's grace and forgiveness. And this is the point of hope here. If you kept a record of sins, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. Do you know that your sin has been forgiven, that your sin has been taken away from you, 
that although your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow, that he's removed them as far as the east is from the west, that we are recipients of his grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. If God records my wrongs, the stuff I've done wrong, I don't have to admit, uh, Nathan, I'm sorry to tell you this, but on the way down here the other day, um, I saw this flashing light as I went past this little camera. <clears throat> well, the police department does obviously keep a record of wrongs, <laughs> and I'm $120 lighter. That's the first time in 10 years, but there you are. It happens to all of us. But God wipes it out. Everything. All that, that rebellion, even now, and the feelings and the wrongdoings and the fact that sometimes I say stuff and sometimes I do stuff that hurts people, even my wife, who I love more than anybody else. And God says, I wipe it out. I wipe it out. This, this is hope. God forgives you and me on account of his son, Jesus Christ. There is confidence. There, God forgives. That is fertile soil for the flourishing Christian life. I am forgiven. I know I find that very hard from time to time, but I am forgiven by God. Third, the, the, the psalmist says he keeps thinking about life and forgiveness and hope and grace. We have confidence in God's word. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Some of the most disappointing times in my life ha have been when someone promised me something and didn't fulfill it. Life teaches us, doesn't it, that, that people don't always keep their promises. And it's something I, with my children, I always tried to, if I made a promise, to keep it, no matter what. I think in reflection on life, this, the, the current state of marriages seems to indicate that so many do not value the power of promises. But you and I can be confident that God does keep his promises. He's faithful, his word is truth, and we can count on it. And he's faithful even, even when I am not. The story of the Old Testament tells the story of an unfaithful people to whom God keeps his, com uh, his commitments and his promises time and time again. And that's true for me as well as you. God reveals his character. He reveals himself through his word and his promises and commitment to us. And we can trust him. He will keep his promises. So the psalmist says, I wait for the Lord more than watchman for the morning, more than watchman for the morning. We wait and we watch. We know that full physical health is not ours yet. We know that full spiritual health is not ours yet. The life without pain and suffering is still to come. But it is guaranteed. And Jesus signs that guarantee in his own blood. We're certain it is to come. So we wait in eager expectation and we're watchful. We flourish because we know the end. And we know that end is sure. And fourthly, we have confidence in God's redemption. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. He himself will redeem Israel from all their sins. Confidence flourishes in communities formed by Christ, sustained by his spirit and his word. Friends, as, as Nathan said earlier, we've been given this hope to share. No wonder the psalmist gets excited. Remember, he, we, we found him in the pits, and now he's saying, Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love. God redeems, and he entrusts us as messengers of his word, as of co-workers with him in the gospel. We who are, deserve his anger and wrath are recipients of his grace, undeserved and unearned. In Christ, he has indeed removed our sins as far as the east from the west. And we long that everybody should know this. In this context where we live, we live in a place just like the culture of my two friends. They have no hope, they cannot discern any meaning in life, and they live one day at a time. Brothers and sisters in Christ, the way we live really matters. 
I'm not trying to say that we don't suffer. We do. Certainly, we, we still have questions. All our questions will not be answered yet. But we flourish under the grace of God as a testimony to the reality of that faith. People look at us. They do look at Christians and they say, how do they continue to flourish under that pain, under that suffering, whether it's relational or physical or mental or emotional? Because our God gives us hope. So it's no wonder then that Paul can boast, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. His boasting is not arrogance. It is in the finished and complete work of Jesus Christ. We are justified. We are declared righteous in Jesus Christ by faith in him. We're God's children. No matter what happens in this life, we're assured because of Jesus. No matter what suffering you're undergoing, there is hope. There is hope. God develops our character and he deepens our faith in suffering. When we suffer, he's not abandoned us. Remember, his son Jesus was the suffering servant. But he calls on us to trust us, trust him through it. Just as with our Lord, we learn obedience through suffering. He develops our character, but he never deserts us. Can I finish with the words from Romans 5, verse 5, which I've taken from the New American Standard Version. Hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Our Father, thank you that we have a hope that does not disappoint us. Never disappoint us. But please, we pray, help us to trust you in the times, like with this guy who wrote this psalm, when life deals out the rubbish and it continues to do that because we have chosen to ignore and reject you. So as our world continues to suffer, like the world, like the world that you created, we may groan, but we also have this great expectation that we will see you one day and then all will be revealed. And in the meantime, may that hope that you give us flourish to the glory of Christ. Amen. Thank you.